Good morning, good morning, East Point Church. If you are ready for the Bible, give me an oh yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. If you are awake this morning, give me an oh yeah. yeah. I just got to know what I'm working with. You know what I mean? When I walk in, if the energy of the room is here, then I'm with you. But if it's here, we got to do something about it. So clearly you guys are in need of some energy. So um, I'm not sure if you're a fan, but can I give you some dad jokes? Yeah. All right. All right. Open up your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. And as you turn there, I'm going to share with you a dad joke. How many of you would consider yourself a professional dad joker? I'm just curious. Any? Look at all the ladies rolling their eyes, right? Uh-huh. Some of you ladies are good at dad jokes. Well, here we go. The, the rule in my house is if I laugh, it's considered funny. So I don't even need you guys. I'm just going to have fun here. There are two types of people in this world. Those who like math, those who love math, and those who hate math. Nothing. Oh, they'll get it later. There are two types of people in this world. Those who sing in the shower and those who are lying. Oh, this is rough, man. I got to dig deeper here. All right, there are two types of people in this world. Those who like Taylor Swift and everyone else. I'm a Swift. I'm not going to lie. Come on now. We're going to keep it real in church. I'm a Swifty. It's all right. Yeah. Anyway, there are two types of people in this world. I actually just experienced this past week to, on a serious note. I was having pizza with a friend. There are two types of people in this world. Those who fold their pizza and those who don't deserve pizza. I, I was like, she pulled out a fork and a knife and I said, what is happening right now? All right. There are two types of people in this world. Those who love bacon and those who are wrong. Come on now, somebody, right? There are two types of people in this world. Those are probably my favorite type of dad joke at this moment. My kids don't get it, but they laugh because I laugh. You know, they're very impressionable. But sometimes we, we use this expression, and it's not a joke, right? There are two types of people in this world. Sometimes we, we try to make a more thoughtful point, some commentary on the world, and so we might say something like, there are two types of people in this world. Those who erect walls and those who build bridges. Hmm, right? Maybe you've heard that one. There are two types of people in this world, those who talk about their dreams and those who chase their dreams. Hmm. There are two types of people in this world, those who see problems as obstacles and those who see their problems as opportunities. There are two types of people in this world. What do these all have in common? Whether they're jokes or whether they're serious, all of these phrases, all of these sayings, there is an attempt to boil down the world. There's an effort to make sense of the world by boiling it down to a single most important distinction. All of the other differences are just details compared to this single overarching reality, and everyone in the world is either A or B. This is a lens. This is how we try to make sense of our world. And so let me ask you this. What is the single filter that you're using to make sense of this world? How would you answer the question? There are only two types of people. What are they? A single most important distinction. If you've never thought of it that way, but I promise you, all of us, whether we realize it or not, we are viewing the world, we are viewing through man, humanity through such a lens. We, we are creating in our mind this overarching dividing line, a singular distinction through which we interpret everything else in life. And, and that's basically what culture is doing. Culture is trying to sell us a narrative. They're trying to sell us a, a lens that can make sense of our world. And so maybe you said, you know, there are only two types of people in this world, those who have power and those who don't. There are only two types of people in this world, victims and victors. There are only two types of people in this world, those who vote red and those who vote blue. There are only two types of people. The, the best way to understand the, the cosmic struggle of existence, there are only two types of people, men and and women. That's the battle that it all boils down to. Or maybe you're from the Eastern Shore and you're a good old boy and you said, there are only two types of people in this world. <laughs> the from here's and the from there's, right? How many of you, I've heard that when I moved here, right? You're either from the shore or you're not. It's only two types of people. In our final passage of Malachi this morning, God says 
there really are only two types of people. There are only two types of people in the world, and he's not joking. And he tells us there are those who fear God, and there are those who don't. That's it. There are those who honor God as a big deal, who treat him with reverential awe and wonder, wow, and those who do not. There are only two types of people in this world, and this week we see both of them in Malachi. Turn with me, chapter 3, starting in verse 13. This is what it says. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of, of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogance blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Let's pause right there. There are only two types of people in this world and we see group one right here. Group one are those who don't fear God. And Malachi makes it very clear. Those who don't fear God see no point in serving him. See, the people, they've been talking. The people, they're having some conversation around the water cooler, and the Lord says that their words, the conclusions that they're coming to, are, are hard against him. They're, they're harsh. They're, they're grating to his ears like nails on a chalkboard. He says, ah. Oh. And so let's listen into their conversation. What is it that they're saying? What is it that's grating against the ears of the Lord? Listen to their conversation. It is vain to serve God. Psh, what's the point? Where's the profit? Yeah, I agree. It doesn't pay to serve God. It is useless to follow his ways. There's no benefit to walking in mourning, to be sorrowful about our sins. Yeah, and another thing, look at those guys. Look at the evildoers. Not only are they prospering, they're escaping judgment. There's no consequences. There's no difference between those who follow evil and those who follow good. So why bother? Do you hear their words? Look at the thought bubble. Listen to what they're saying, and I'm asking you. Is that true? It can seem like that sometimes, can't it? Are they right? Is there no difference in outcomes between those who pursue evil and those who pursue God? Is walking with God useless? Spoiler, no it is not. We'll get there. But it seems that way to them because they're suffering with our sixth and final symptom, and I call it short-sighted vision. You see this conversation around the water cooler. They, they're not seeing a difference in outcomes because they can't see beyond the moment in front of them. They don't have the foresight, the ability to play the movie to its logical conclusion. Follow this road. Follow the path of evil to the end and see where it leads. There's no point. And so as we listen to them talk, we realize that these people are not serving God out of a heart that loves him. They're serving God out of a desire to get things from him. Mm. They don't fear God. They don't see him as a big deal. No, they're dealing with him, can I say it this way, in like a superstitious way. If we play by his rules, it will go well for us and we'll get the things we want. I call it the divine vending machine. Okay? Do you guys know what a vending machine is? Right? You know how it works, right? You, if you push the right buttons, don't get it wrong, man. Nothing worse than getting the, the Almond Joys. Nobody likes Almond Joys. I meant D4. No, you're wrong. There are two types of people in this world. Those who like Almond Joys and the right people, okay? Godly people. If I push the right button, if I put in sufficient payment... I know we have like the tappers now, right? And so, but before the tappers, how many of y'all remember when we used to have to like breathe our hot breath on that dollar bill and iron it out on the side of the machine? Because it would keep spitting it out if it was crinkled, you know? If I do the right things, if I follow the rules and, and approach the machine right, I will get what I want. It's a vending machine. And, and remember the worst was when the machine ate your money? Remember when that was like in our, it ate my money, right? And so what do we all do when the machine eats our money or it spits out the wrong thing? 
we shake the machine, right? As if it worked ever in the history of mankind, right? We, all, we bang the machine, we shake it, we throw our hands up and go, what's the point? There's no profit. We did everything right, and yet we didn't get what we wanted, and so there is no benefit. All of this is pointless. This is how they're approaching God. They don't want God with all of their heart. They want things from him. And when they don't get those things from him, they bang the machine, throw their hands up, and walk away in frustration. It's pointless. This is short-sighted vision. And if we can keep it real, we all have a little bit of that vending machine mentality in our lives, don't we? All of us, come on, you got to be real, right? Well, you know, if I clean up my act, then, right? If I go out of my way and help my neighbor, if I follow God, then I will get fill in the blank, right? If I treat other people nice, if I give more money, if I go to church, if I go to church for four weeks in a row without missing, if I read my Bible, and we do all of the rules and press the right buttons, But what happens is, in our disappointment, when we don't get what we want, we will either shake the machine in frustration, walk away and say, what's the profit? Or we'll realize that the Lord might actually be wanting to wean us off of our desires for lesser trinkets and to teach us to long for truer treasures. Could it be, friends, like, could it be that the Lord allows, graciously allows disappointment in our life? He graciously allows us to have these unfulfilled desires because he's trying to train us to stop aiming for happiness and to aim for true joy, a joy that satisfies our soul and quenches the thirst of our longing. It's him. It's him. The greatest treasure of all is God himself. God is our prize. To know him. Like, friends, forget the vending machine. To know God, to be known by God is a joy. It is a blessing that transcends any material blessing we could hope for. That's the true prize. We say it with Paul, that I may know him That's the kind of joy that regardless of my circumstances, regardless of my anxieties, regardless of my worries, at the end of the day, it's all good because I have him. He is our desire. One of my favorite little books written by a man named A.W. Tozer, it's called The Pursuit of God. Highly recommend it. But listen to what he says. He says, the man who has God for his treasure has all things in one. I just wonder how many times we're sitting here hoping for for one little snack out of the vending machine and God is like, I want to give you something so much greater, me. I want to be the kind of man that, that says what the psalmist says in Psalm 73. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. He's our prize, East Point Church, to know him and to be known by him. But we see group one. Group one, they do not fear God, and so they see no point in serving him. And so they walk away from the vending machine, shaking their fist at God, saying, why bother? But there's a second group of people. Look at the next verse, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord. And esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. There are two types of people in this world. We saw those who don't fear God, and now we see those who do fear God. And here's what Malachi says. Those who fear God, check it, are known by God. Those who fear God, who walk in awe and honor, are known by God. 
And so Malachi, he has this accusation, right? He, he's calling out the people. We saw group one walk away, but something amazing happens. Look at your Bibles. There is a group of people. There's a remnant. There's a squad who they don't respond with hard-hearted rebuttal. Instead, they respond with humility. Their hearts are pricked, and, and they actually respond well. What does it say? They spoke with one another. Oh, that's my favorite line. They spoke with one another. They spoke with one another. They, they come together and they deliberate. They're not ignoring God's instruction. They're not saying, okay, Malachi, whatever, be easy. No, they come together and, and they take it to heart. There's a group of people who look in the mirror and they take a gut check and they go, is this us? They go, we got to talk about this. And they speak with one another, the word of God. They, they call each other. They, they have a holy huddle, and they go, let's talk about the word of God. Why are they doing this? Because these are those who fear the Lord. This humble response, this is the response of those who esteem his name. They're coming together to talk about it. Friends in this room, do you have a community of people who fear the Lord? How often is it said of you, and those who feared the Lord got together for donuts and Bible time? Those who feared the Lord came together weekly in their Bible study to discuss his word. Those who feared the Lord got together and they spoke and they reminded each other of truth. Do you have those kinds of people in your life? Do you belong to a community of those who fear the Lord? Do you have that spiritual extended family that can whisper in your ear, don't forget the Lord, even while the world is shouting foolishness in your other ear. I need you, East Point Church. We need each other. Do you have that, those group of people? Is it said of you, those who fear the Lord, spoke with one another? We need each other. I know you're strong and independent, and you can do it on your... Friends, sometimes, group one... It sounds like they have a point. Sometimes we hear the culture saying, what's the point? Is there a benefit, really? And you go, you know what? They're kind of right. You need people in your life that can go, stop it. No, they don't have a point. You know what I think we need at East Point Church? We need to become more childish. How many of y'all had good friends when you were kids? Remember how easy it was to make friends? Remember how our little, our, our little kids walk up to the playground, hi, what's your name? Want to be my friend? I'm like, how does he do it? taking notes of my four-year-old. When we were kids, we knew instinctively that we needed a crew. Here's a dad joke for you. You know what the greatest miracle Jesus ever performed was? Having 12 close friends in his 30s. <laughs> it's hard. Some of you are younger than 30. You don't get it. You're like, of course I have friends. There's just something about life where it becomes harder to make friends. When was the last time you had somebody over for dinner? Just because. When was the last time you went across the room and met somebody new? When was the last time we stopped assuming that all of our close friends are already in our life? What if the best friend you'll ever have in your life, the best solid brother or sister in the faith, you haven't even met them yet? Oh, yeah. Friends, we need to become more childlike. May it be said of us every week in community groups, those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. Those who feared the Lord broke bread with one another. Those who feared the Lord got together every Tuesday night and ate some good food and brownies and then studied God's word. Who do you have in your life? Please, East Point Church, we need each other. And so these people, they're speaking. And I want you to notice God's reaction. You gotta like highlight this in your Bible. Because group one, when group one was talking, God went like this. Oh, your words are just grating against me. But when group two speaks, he goes like this. Look what it says. Those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. And what happened? The Lord paid attention. The Lord heard them. The Lord tunes in at this conversation. He sees these people in humble repentance, taking a look in the mirror, and he perks up. Why? Because humility and repentance are music in the ears of God. You see, you have to understand the God of the Bible, he longs to show mercy to sinners. What do you long to do? 
Like, I long to go on the boat and go fishing, right? I long to get the kayak out on the river. I long to take a nap this afternoon. I long to bake my pastor chocolate chip cookies. I lo- Whatever it is that you are longing to do with all your heart, you know what God longs to do? He longs to show grace to those who realize they need it. That's why Jesus was BFFs with sinners and tax collectors. Because he loves it. Like a kid on Christmas, he loves to show grace and mercy. When we say, you're right, I need help, he hears and he pays attention. He tunes in and he sees you. And in a stunning act of recognition, he honors you. Look what God does. He calls for the angels, and he calls for the heavenly journals. He says, bring out the royal journals, it says, and he has their names recorded in a book of remembrance. Now, you got to understand, in the old days, I'm talking like Lord of the Rings old days, right, with kings and queens, all right, Middle Earth age, there was no internet. And so if you were a king, how would you know what your great-great-granddaddy had in his laws? They were all written down. The royal journals in the royal library kept the records of all the laws and the edicts and the statutes that were passed down. And you know what else they wrote in the journals? They wrote names of people who had earned the king's favor. There were names of people, and as if to say, you have caught the king's attention. He sees you. You have earned his favor. He owes you a reward, and to have your name written was the greatest acknowledgement of the king. To have your name written in the book was the greatest prize, was the greatest treasure. You're like, the king saw me. No, he didn't see you. He was waving at the person behind you. No, he saw me and he wrote my name in his book of remembrance. God in heaven has a book of remembrance. And you know who he writes in his book of remembrance? Do you know who he notices? Do you know who earns his favor and and his acknowledgement? Those who feared the Lord. Look at the text. Those who feared the Lord. These are the names of those that he writes in his book. The name of every man in human history. The name of every woman in human history who honors God. It's in his book. And as God in heaven flips through these pages, he goes, these are mine. (laughs) These are my treasured possession. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He acknowledges you. And so group one, they're over here going, what's the point? There's no benefit in serving God, but group two exalts. No benefit. I'm known by God. Look at the book. What do you mean there's no benefit? He sees me. He knows me. And I am his, in his book of remembrance. You see, sometimes in 2024, we look around and it seems like there is no discernible difference. There's no discernible advantage for those who fear God over those who don't. But friends, on that day, look ahead, on that day, at the end of the world, when the season of redemption gives way to the era of divine justice, he says, you will see the distinction. You will see the difference between these two groups of people because my people will not face judgment. You will see that my treasured possession, I treat them with mercy and grace. On that day, I spare those who are mine as a father does his child. On that day, you will see that there are only two types of people, those who serve God and those who don't. So the group, the first group says, there's no point in serving God. And the second group says, nope, false. Here's the point. Those who live for God will forever be with God. Those who live for God will forever in eternity be known and be with God. That's the point. And so we stand here and and we ask, so uh, how do I get my name in that book, <laughs> right? Like, how do I get my name on the list? Uh, do you want the good news first or the bad news? All right, I'll give you the bad news. Nothing. There is nothing that you can do. Come on. There is nothing that you can do in your own human strength 
to get God's attention. There is no good that I can do. And I've tried. Trust me. There is no amount of button pushing behavior. There's nothing I can do that makes God look at me and be impressed and go, wow, I see you. There's nothing. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ did for you what you can't do for yourself. Jesus Christ, he came to earth and he offers, he says, come to me and I will write your name in my book of life. Come to me and on my dime you will come into God's good graces. Come to me, follow me, and I will clothe you with my righteousness and I will put my spirit inside of you to teach you and to empower you to honor God from the inside out. I will teach you how to live for God because those who live for God will forever be with God. Friends, there are two types of people in this world, but it can be hard to see the difference sometimes. And so at the end of this passage, God plays the movie to the end because the cure for short-sighted vision is eternal perspective. Verse 1, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. The day of the Lord is coming. And the day of the Lord will either be a blessing or a curse. There's a day coming. Friends, we we need to know the playbook here. Jesus tells us very clearly, there is a day coming when he will decisively step into human history and he will bring an end to suffering, an end to evil, an end to sin. Okay? We're calling it Operation Eden 2.0. He is remaking the garden. There will be no apples allowed because we're not going through that again, okay? He's going to remake it all. No more pain or suffering. It's coming. But on that day when he comes, these two groups of people will have two very different experiences. And so look at group number one. Right? For those who reject God, for those who perpetuate evil, that day, he says, it will be like a burning oven. And you're like, what do burnt cookies have to do with anything? Not that kind of oven, okay? Now, this is a very heavy illustration, but I believe it's one that they understood, and so I'm going to help you understand it, right? This is actually a farming metaphor, okay? And so what the farmers would do, they would tread the grain, and what that would do is that would loosen the grain from the shell. They would loosen the grain from the straw. And so you have it all separate and then they would winnow it. And what that was doing is that would help you separate what is the grain that will endure and the chaff, the immaterial, insubstantial stuff that that you throw it in the oven and there's no more trace of it. It's consumed. You see, this, this level of sorting that a farmer would do, that is a metaphor of what God is going to do when he comes. Like a fire at the end of the harvest, his justice will be complete and inescapable. He will leave no trace of evil in the world. He'll be very thorough in remaking the new heavens and the new earth. And so those who perpetuate evil, those who arrogantly reject God, they will experience the oven of God's judgment. Hmm. That's heavy, isn't it? We talked about this a couple weeks ago about judgment and and there are a lot of emotions when we feel things like this. And all of us who have Twitter, you, you can hear the objections of culture in your ear. God's not loving. That's not God. Or my favorite objection, there's a difference between the New Testament God and the Old Testament God. And so I want the New Testament God. Are they right? We hear these objections, and and so I want to give you three things. I want to give you a few things here that you cannot even begin to understand the judgment of God. You can't even begin to understand these verses if you don't have a few of these handholds in your pocket, all right? So number one, before you could understand what he's talking about here and how this even fits in with the whole Bible, number one is context. We can't discuss 
God's coming judgment without remembering that his judgment is stage two of his divine response plan to evil. Remember? Come on, guys, remember, stage one, that's what we're living in now. Stage one, his response plan to evil, his preferred response to evil is to redeem it. And so he sends Jesus on a rescue mission to redeem humanity. We see that in stage one, Jesus stood in the face of divine justice so that whoever believes in him need not perish but have eternal life. you got to understand context. Stage one comes first. But then eventually, stage one will give way to stage two. And he will change his plan from redeeming sin to removing sin. So don't engage in a conversation about judgment until you set the context. The second thing that we got to remember here is that the bad news is what makes the good news good. We can't ignore these verses. We don't, we don't just it, it remove these passages from our, from our Bibles to go, ooh, that's uncomfortable, that's, that's not modern enough. No, guys, what? The bad news is what makes the gospel good. How many of you have ever referred to your walk with Jesus using these words? I was saved in, we use words like saved. The New Testament uses words like salvation. Have you ever thought about that? What are you saying that you were saved from? You were saved from the wrath of to come. The New Testament acknowledges that because Jesus has come, he saves us from the coming judgment. He saves us from facing justice. And so listen, because of Jesus, that's the good news. Yes, judgment is coming. We're not going to ignore it. Because the good news is because of Jesus, we need not face the judgment. We need not face justice. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul says this, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is not Old Testament versus New Testament. Both Testaments acknowledge stage one and stage two of God's response plan. He is coming to bring justice. But good news, Jesus saves us. And then here, I think, is the most important. You can't understand justice. You can't talk about judgment without this critical piece. Number three, God's heart. When you read those verses, how many of you pictured a God doing this? <laughs> All right, and our culture pictures a God who is gleefully and eagerly waiting. Our culture is picturing a gotcha God. Gotcha! I can't wait to give you justice. I, I just can't wait to zap him. I, I can't wait to punish humanity. That is not the God of the Bible. And if that's the God you picture, you will misinterpret these verses. God's heart is rather this. Think about it like this. Why has he not come back yet? Because he doesn't have a watch. No! Why has God not come back yet and implemented this plan? Peter tells us why. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. No, he is patient toward you, wishing that, any, that not any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The reason why God has not come back yet is because his heart is patient. One more. One more. He's extending stage one as long as he can so that more and more people would respond to Jesus' rescue mission. Friends, this is why we at East Point Church, we are so passionate about the mission. One of our discipleship values, we engage the mission. This is not a country club. This is not a nice event that we put on once a week for your entertainment. We are not distributing goods and services. Friends, this is a mission. Jesus Christ is continuing his soul-saving mission through his church. The church is the hope of the world. And so forgive us that we will do, nothing, we will do everything short of sinning to reach people with the gospel. We will use all of our creativity. We will spend lots of money. We will expend all of our energy and resources and time so that our neighbors and so that our loved ones and so that our family members would respond to the soul-saving mission of Jesus. God's heart is that none should perish. And so our heart is that none should perish. And so you know what? When we preach to the world, we are not trying to scare them with stage two judgment. Let me be very clear. We're not trying to scare the world into submission with stage two judgment. You'll burn. What? what? I get sick to my stomach when I see people misrepresenting the Lord so much. 
We don't scare people with stage two. We woo them with stage one. We compel them with the grace of the redemption available in Christ. And we say to the watching world, yes, we will give an account for our lives one day. Yes, God is coming and so is justice. But that bad news is the backdrop that makes what's in the foreground so beautiful. Grace is available. Jesus is here. Believe and be saved. It's free. That's our message. And we are passionate about that message. And so let's keep going. I don't want to miss the point here. The point that he's making is, This will be a very different day for two groups of people. Group one will experience his justice like an oven. But look at the second group. For those who fear my name, that day will not feel like an oven. It will feel like the sun. The sunrise is the universal symbol for hope. The night is done. The darkness is fleeing. The shadows are over. And we feel the warmth of the sun on our face and we rejoice. A new day has dawned. Friends, for those of you who fear God, his future coming will be like a new day dawning. You will feel the warmth of the sun of righteousness on your face as darkness flees, as sin is defeated, as evil gives way and righteousness reigns. And the Bible says that you will dance. And it's not very flattering. It says you will dance like cows. <laughs> I'm just being mean. Uh, it, it says that, though. All right? It says you will leap like calves, like baby. Have you ever seen a baby calf let out of its stall after a long winter? I haven't either. That's okay. But I Googled it, and they leap and they jump. They have so much relief after being pent up for the winter. And they say, finally, we will leap in that day, saying, finally. Evil is no more. God has returned. Let me be very clear, Christian. God's arrival will be a great day for you. I don't care what the books say. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what Tom Cruise's hair looks like in the latest end of the world film. That day is not anything to fear. It is a good day. It will be a great day for you. No fear of condemnation. No fear of judgment because Jesus took the judgment for you. No fear, no guilt in life, no pain in death. God is coming for you, Christian. Not with judgment, with healing in his wings, it says. That he brings us near like a mama bird, and in the shadow of his wings, we find restoration and transformation. All the broken things will be made right as he draws near. And then he ends with this metaphor Continuing the farming metaphor, he says, you will tread over them. He says, ashes under their feet. Remember, in in this life, they seemed to escape judgment. There seemed to be no consequences. They seemed to be prospering. But in that day, we will have perspective. Because they will be like the insubstantial stuff that fades away. They will not be prospering. They will be like those that are trampled on at the end of the harvest. But in contrast, those who fear the Lord, those who live for God, will forever be with God. Those who live for God will forever be with God. And that's the end of the sixth confrontation. And I picture Malachi, he puts down the pen, he just released that oracle, that burden of the Lord, and he finishes all six confrontations, and then he picks up the pen, and he And he tags on a little conclusion. And he says one more thing. Look at the last few verses. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter desecration. Last thing Malachi says. He goes, remember. Remember his word. Remember and follow his ways. Remember the law. He says, keep the commandments. Remember what God taught you. Follow him. All of us in this room, we are trying to navigate our way through a crazy world. And Malachi's like, it's right here. Here's the design. Here's the roadmap. Here's the operating system that you should download for your life. He goes, keep the commands. 
walk and find true life here. And all of us in this room said, easier said than done. (laughs) Yeah, amen, easier said than done, right? Easier said than done. But this is why God will send his messenger to help the people not forget. With the same prophetic message as Elijah, this messenger will call people back to God's word. He will help them remember. He will remind them. I love this powerful metaphor. It says he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of children to the father. This is an idiom. He will help them change their hearts. Their hearts will become soft and tender. The kind of change that you see in a family that goes from hard-hearted hostility to tender humility. Remember, he says. But here's the reality, church. We need more than reminders, don't we? If all it took was a reminder, I'd be a saint already, right? I'd be Mother Teresa herself. Call me Father Teddy, right? If all I needed was reminders, remember, is that it? But we need more than reminders. We need an inside-out work. And that's why after this messenger, turn a couple pages, and you'll see that God sends an even greater messenger. You see, Jesus doesn't just remind us of God's ways. He perfectly walks in God's ways. And then in unimaginable love, Jesus stands in the place of the wicked. Jesus became like the chaff that is tread underfoot. Jesus faces the wrath of the Father like an oven so that you could experience the grace of the Father like the Son. And this Jesus calls you to come and follow him. He says, come and learn from me, and I will write these words. I won't just give you a reminder in your ears that you can't keep. I will write these words on your heart. I will transform you from the inside out. I will make you from a person who does not fear God into a person who does. Because at the end of the day, there are only two types of people. And those who live for God will forever be with God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Even words that, that at first glance seem hard to understand and harsh and, and whatever, Lord, we, we just thank you that as we lean in, we see, no, God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you have always been gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so thank you even for reminding us of the bad news because my prayer is that we would more deeply appreciate, that we'd be filled with more gratitude for the good news. And so, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he took our place, that he faced divine justice so that we can experience your grace and compassion. Lord, as we respond to this whole series, would you just change us? whether it's our first time coming to you in faith for the first time in our hearts or we've been coming to you daily for decades. We are just here again, committing ourselves to you, saying, God, have your way. We turn to you, we believe in you, and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. (sighs) Feels like we just got done with a road trip, right? Seven weeks in the book of Malachi and, and you get out of the car and you're just like, oh! And you're stretching, and you're like, that was a trip. And hopefully, like any good trip, you're someplace different now than when you started. How many of you are grateful for God's word for the last seven weeks? Thank you, Lord. Has God spoken to you? Has, has he spoken to you in your community groups? Has he spoken to you through this word? I'm curious, how many of you for the first time ever, like you, before this year, you've never read the book of Malachi? I'm just curious. Anybody? Cool. Yeah, all right, cool. We're growing. It's exciting. And so here's what I want to do. I don't want to leave this road trip too soon. I don't want to just walk away. I want, I'm going to invite you to sit back in your seats. I want you to make an altar. And I want you to think back over these six, seven weeks. Think back to those conversations. Think back to the marriage sermon. Think back to the, to the road signs. Think back to those couple weeks where we had the altar. And, and for a few moments, I want you to put yourself on the altar. And I want you to say, Lord, which of these six do you really want me to leave with from this road trip? What do you want to do in my heart, God? Wherever you want to speak, I'm listening. And so as Emily sings some special music, I'm going to invite you just to create an altar where you are and reflect on the Lord.